Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Stella. This is our class number three of Personal Money Management Business 493 for this summer term 2021. My name is Rick Hassey, and today our topic is investments. And um, I want to just go over a couple of things to update you on uh, where we are at the halfway point of our directed study. I have posted assignment number two, and the solutions are in Blackboard. I'm going to be going over uh, a, a little bit detail the portfolio work of that assignment because you're doing the same thing again this coming week in assignment number three, our third and final assignment, uh, which will be due this coming Saturday and on it's going to be subject of investing. Uh, also, you have one more grade after uh, this which would be your case paper topic. And I'll post those topics next weekend in my uh, midweek or my uh, mid-class uh, prior to the August to July 24th class to uh, you have two weeks to do a paper and I will post those topics next week. So just first of all, let's just take a look at a couple of infrastructure things. Here's our Blackboard site. There we go. And first of all, uh, in the uh, assignment section, there is assignment number three, which is some questions about uh, investing and also uh, one question on insurance, which will be our topic next class. Uh, so uh, that assignment is ready for you to be done. Again, it's just similar to assignment number two, where you answer the questions on one file and then post a portfolio spreadsheet updating your portfolio uh, for, the, uh, for the third assignment. And uh, again, as you can see in assignment two, I posted the solutions and a sample portfolio. So if you're having difficulties with the portfolio setup, you can download that file and insert your own uh, firms and uh, you're right up to date. So uh, if you use that, if you're, if you're having a difficulty with that portfolio file. Uh, and this is week is class number three, it's entitled investments. A couple things to note. There's uh, some samples of what some typical investments look like. There's the stock certificate of uh, Walt Disney Company and a bond certificate of Pennzoil. And in this week's introduction video, I gave you a, a brief video explaining the difference between stocks and bonds. Also, there's the part, port, uh, PowerPoint uh, for our lecture of today, which uh, you can download and review if you like. And some, there's our introduction video, our agenda, and then some other vid uh, videos if you'd like to watch them. And then uh, uh, some description of the uh, chapter four on investments, uh, talking about stocks and, and mutual funds and all kinds of things, bonds, which uh, highlight the discussion of chapter four. So there, we're all up to date there. Now let me bring up our portfolio. Just to explain it again, to make sure you guys understand this, because this is our topic for this week, is investments and investing of, of portfolios and stocks and, and investments. And this is as of the assignment two uh, last week. Notice there's my original portfolio of the beginning of class, June 11th. I selected Apple, Bristol Myers, Merrick, and Walt Disney Company. And also the uh, three main Dow, Dow S&P 500 and NASDAQ indexes, which are indexes of generally purchased stocks in the market that are called market indicators. On July 2nd, I updated my portfolio by copying the number of shares that I purchased with the, when I calc calculated that in my original portfolio, copy that down here, and then finding the new price of my four stocks and multiplying that new price times my original shares purchased to get my new valuation. And as you can see, I've made about three thousand fifty-six dollars uh, in that time span in the mark in my portfolio, which is roughly a three percent gain. In other words, how did I determine that three percent? I took this difference of 3,000 and divided it into my original investment, and I get 3.06% or 0 0.0306, and that in the percent is 3.06. Then I found what the markets have changed to July 2nd, 
And the markets have changed this much. And I beat the Dow, I beat the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, uh, I didn't beat, but I'm pretty close to it. So in all in all, uh, my, our, my portfolios and a couple of, and your portfolios did pretty well too, especially you, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, how you compare yourself to the market. And this is why we invest, to increase our valuation over time by investing in stock and companies that are performing well and the markets thinks they're performing well. So the law of supply and demand means people, <coughs> excuse me, people are willing to pay more to own that stock. Thus, your value goes up and you make money, but you only make money when you sell it uh, or, or the company pays you a dividend. Uh, and a dividend naturally is a company paying you for the amount of shares you've invested in them, giving you a reward of their cash flow and profits. So all you have to do for assignment three is update this date to July 16, and then find your new prices and find the new Dow and the indexes, and you're done. So uh, you don't even have to include your July 2nd data, just replace the date and you can show me your performance through this Friday, July 16th. So again, this portfolio file is located in the solutions of assignment two and you're welcome to download it and use it as long and also, but study what it tells you. In the case of my portfolio, it tells me that my pick of four stocks that I thought, thought was interested to own gave me a return of a little over $3,000. Now, the only way I can get that return is to sell it on July 2nd. I'm not selling it. I'm gonna continue on and I'll sell it at the end of our class. And how did I do with those four companies in relationship to the overall market? The Dow Jones Industrial Average is the top 30, shares, 30 companies as designated by the Wall Street Journal. The S&P 500 is the top 500 companies in the exchange or the stock market as selected by the company Standard & Poor's. And the NASDAQ index is the 2,500 companies or so that make up the NASDAQ exchange and their relative indexes. So it's a, it's a combination of different companies and how they performed over time comparing to my performance of my four stocks in that time period. What you wanna do when you invest in a 401k or in an, invest in a pension fund or invest in Robinhood or E-Trade or Schwab is you wanna find companies that in your anticipation are going to give you growth and value into the future. That's why we invest, to enhance and create value. Also, we invest for so that money can go back into the economy and create more growth, more jobs. And that's what we read about every day in the business papers or we see on the news is how the markets are doing because it's a big, large indicator of our economy. So that's our portfolio. So what, one of the key things to investment is why are we investing? What's the purpose of investing? What are we trying to do? Naturally, probably we're trying to make money, but are we making money to buy a car in a year or are we making money to retire in 40 years? Are we making money to stay ahead of inflation or are we making money to buy a house in 10 years? One of the most important things about investing is you kind of have you don't have to have a, a very detailed idea, but have some much, how, what do you plan to do with this money? Why are you investing? Retirement, college, kids, family, vacation, cars, real estate. What are, you, what are you investing for? What are your goals? And where's the money come from? Are you taking it out of your savings? Are you taking it out of your paycheck? Are you, if you have come up with a tax refund or you win a lottery, Where's this money come from? And how does that taking that money affect when you need money today to just run your normal living standards? And that's going back to our discussions earlier is about budgeting. How much in your planning do you incorporate investing? Maybe I don't have enough money left over. All right, that's fine. But how do you manage this? 
And the last one is how much risk are you willing to assume? Or do you want to give your money to a company you never heard of in anticipation of them doing very well? Or do you want to give your money to companies that you already know about? Apple, Facebook, General Motors, whatever. What's the risk involved in your goals? Yeah, Mr. Hassey, I want to make a lot of money. But in order to make a lot of money, you got to risk. You got to put your money out there where there's a chance you might lose it. How much risk are you willing to assume in an investment program? Very important. And what possible personal or economic conditions are going to happen in the future that might affect your investment goals? Do you plan, could you be, could you be laid off? Are you going to go get away from work for a while and go get a finish up your college degree or go to graduate school? Are you going to get married? Are you going to have children? All these change investment goals. Your investment goals when you're 25 and single are a lot different than when you're 40 and married with two kids. Are these goals reasonable? Don't just say, oh, I'm going to put uh, $10, $10 into a 401k every week or an IRA. And then uh, hopefully that grows to a million dollars in a couple of years. Well, that ain't going to happen. What are, what are your goals and, what, and do you understand how reasonable they are? And also investing establishes sacrifices, basically on two fronts. The sacrifice that you might lose the money you got to be aware of that. You might go down, lose money. And two, you're sacrificing your cash flow today for investing into the future. What are you going to go without? Because you're putting some money into a 401k or an IRA. You're not spending that money today on new clothes, new shoes, gasoline. You have to find the balance in establishing your investment goals. And also it's involved with the time value of money. Hopefully the money you're investing today is going to have a greater value in the future. But that's gonna be limited by inflation. One of the biggest things in discussion today in our economy is what's gonna happen with inflation. We're beginning to come out of the pandemic. Things are heating up. People are spending money. People want more money. Hey, I'm back working in the office again. What last year, I, I could understand, you didn't give me a pay raise. This year, I want, I want 5%. That causes inflation. How much is inflation going to eat into the future value of money? That's a risk. And components of risk, in, as I just said, inflation risk, interest rate risk, business failure risk, market risk. All these things affect companies that you invest in. That's why some of us choose, as, a, as my video pointed out in our introduction video, some of us rather would not be an owner buying stock, would rather be a lender. Lend your money to a company. Lend your money to a bank. Basically, when you open up a savings account at a bank, you're lending your money to the bank. And the bank, how does the bank pay you back? two ways. They make sure your money's always going to be there. And secondly, they'll give you interest, a reward for keeping your money with them. Now, the interest rate's not very high. That's why we call it interest rate risk. Hey, I'm not getting much money out of my savings account. Where can I put my money and make a little bit more? So we lend our money to companies or to the United States government by lending them money for treasuries or bonds in corporations. Again, we'll get interest as a return on that investment. So there we're lending money. When we're owning a company, there's a big risk there because we could lose all the money if the company fails. In bonds or lend, putting money in savings accounts, there's insurance. There's risk insurance. Most bank accounts and savings accounts are insured up to $100,000 by the government. In bonds and lending your money to companies, if the company fails, they have to sell off their assets to pay you back anyway. But with stock investment, there's a higher risk because you don't get paid back. You could lose it all. Understanding these risks and in investments is very important. 
besides giving our money and hopefully increasing that value of money, you're gonna try to get income out of that money, interest, dividends. That interest and dividends is additional cash flow generated off that investment. And that's why a lot of people buy bonds because it's considered a fixed income investment. You're not making any principal or capital gain, but you're getting paid interest over the life of that instrument. And naturally we are in investments to grow, appreciate in value. <clears throat> Basically for us, normal citizens, not the Warren Buffetts or the, the rich people of the world, we can, we can go into a brokerage firm or go online and buy stock. We can go to the bank and put money into a savings account, into an IRA. Remember an IRA is an individual retirement account that is managed by fund managers and you can buy one through your bank. And what it means is when you put money into that, that account, it's tax-free and then it's invested in whatever vehicle you decide. And then when you take it out, preferably when you're retired, 60, 65, 70, it's taxed at a lower amount. It's tax-free until you take it out when you're in a lower bracket. That's an IRA. You're building for the future. But another th bad thing about IRA is liquidity. I put money in an IRA and I wanna take it out in, in a year I'm going to have a penalty on that because when you buy an IRA, it's in the investing manager is anticipating you're going to leave that in for a long time so they can invest it. But the liquidity issue is a problem. Well, I need that money now. So it's my money. I'm taking it out. Okay. But you're going to have to pay a fee. You're going to have to pay a penalty. And you're now going to be taxed by the government when you take out that money. So there's questions of liquidity in investments. Are you gonna suffer consequences by cashing that in before you really need it? Another thing you have to worry about. Now, another thing you, I'm gonna say is, Mr. Hassey, do I have to worry about all this stuff? You know, I got enough enough time, tough enough time taking my kids to Little League and dealing with a boss who has clueless of what's going on. And I'm worried about paying bills and I'm worried about the future of my company that I work for. Why do I have to worry about this? Well, you, you don't have to worry that much about it. Just understand what it means. And then your investment managers, the people who at your bank, at your 401k, at your pension fund, they'll take care of that. Naturally, they'll charge you a fee for it. But at the same time, you don't have to worry about it. They'll manage it. But it's good to know how this all works generally, just so you can sleep at night. Traditional investments. Notice the risk, the liquidity, the growth. I think this is a good little sheet. You can invest in common stock, which is buying stock in any publicly traded corporation. And that stock, you have a vote in the company, a voting share, but you are not guaranteed a dividend. You might get a dividend, but it's not guaranteed. A preferred stock. Again, you own equity in a company, the difference between preferred and common stock is preferred stock has a guaranteed income, a guaranteed dividend. They have to pay you no matter what. Corporate bonds, lending $1,000 to a company and they'll pay you back over time. The minimum corporate bond is $1,000. They pay you at maturity date, want the money back, and then they pay you a coupon, which is interest, during the course of the year and the life of that investment. Government bonds, lending your money to the state of California, lending your money to the United States government. Very safe, very low risk, very little interest. If you give $1,000 today to the United States government and, cal and buy a 10 year, lend it to them for 10 years, that means you give them $1,000 today and in 10 years, they'll pay you back $1,000. Every year, they'll pay you 11 bucks in interest. That's the going interest rate right now on a 10 year United States treasury, 11 bucks. Really, $11 for $1,000? Well, that's $11 every year for 10 years. So that, that ain't bad. 
but at the same time, $11. So it's very safe, but the income is very low. But also government bonds, you can cash in any day, anytime. It's very liquid. Mutual funds, or also now mutual funds slash ETFs, exchange traded funds. These are funds where you pool your money with other investors and you buy into the stock and bond market or even the real estate market or even the commodity market. It's pooling your money with other investors and then a manager takes your money with these other investors and they invest it. It's called a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund. I recommend these funds for people who don't have a lot of time to spend on investments and they can go in and have a manager run those affairs and invest in good in good positions. And then another fat, another inv investment that a lot of us try to get in Southern California, it's a little difficult, is invest in real estate. It helps your quality of life. You have a nice place to live, but at the same time, as we all know, usually real estate values go up over time. Real estate is another type of investment. There's also gold and silver and all these other things. And I know a big topic now is crypto, Dogecoin, all that. But you should buy those in mutual funds. Buy them where other investors are managing and you can own them, but you're in a, some type of fund with other investors. Those are types of investments that we look at. And again, as I said earlier, part of your investment goal is going to drive where you're going to invest your money. If you're young, like in your 20s, you have a long time before you retire and before you uh, are all finished. So you want to invest in growth. You want to invest in institutions that are going to grow. But the older you get, you want to maybe reduce that risk of growth and get in more fixed income, dividends stocks, bonds, where the risk is less and you know you're going to get your money. So you have to take a look at your objectives, the current outlook of the economy, which is a difficult gauge because there's all different types of interpretations where that is involved. And what is your investment horizon? Well, Mr. Hassey, I'm 45, so I'm going to be investing for another 20 years. Or Mr. Hassey, I'm 25, I'm going to be investing for another 40 years. That makes a big deal in how you look at investing. This is generally speaking a, a sample portfolio. Most, one of the reasons why we're doing a portfolio in this class is because you diversify. You don't put all your money into one investment like an Apple computer. You wanna diversify. You wanna put it in different things because if one has an off year, the others might be doing well. So it's balancing out the return on your portfolio. I like to call this the investment pyramid, where it goes from low risk to high risk. Low risk means you're not going to lose your money at all. You're not going to make much money, but you're not going to lose much money. You're not going to get much income, but you're not going to lose it. And then as it goes up the pecking order, notice growth stocks, mutual funds, real estate, rental property. That can grow in value, but there's a risk involved because real estate changes, stocks do go down. And then it gets up to the very top level, speculation, crypto, commodities, gold, silver, oil, stock options, speculation stocks, companies, I wouldn't call this anymore, but when Tesla started, that was a speculation stock when new startup companies who don't have a track record of performance, where do you want to put your money? Well, in a portfolio, you want to put some in level one, two, three, and four. Diversify your portfolio. One of the first things if ever you talk with a stockbroker or, or you want to start uh, an investment fund is explain to them your risk tolerance. Hey, I'm young, go ahead and and let's let's get let's speculate. Let's get aggressive. Or you know what? I'm a very conservative person. I want to make some money, but I don't want to lose much money. I'm a very I'm a conservative investor. What is your risk tolerance? That's very important in investing. 
One of the safest forms of investing is treasuries. Government bonds, lending your money to your local government to build sewers, to build schools. And the good thing about that is in our tax system, if you lend, if you buy a $1,000 Bonita school district bond, they're gonna build a new school. That $1,000 will be paid back to you, but also the interest that is paid to you on that bond is tax-free in the state of California. You're investing in your local community. The interest you receive from the state Bonita School District will not be taxed. It'll be taxed on your federal return, but not on your state, state return. That's what encourages you to invest locally if you want. Invest in your school district. Lend them your money. Invest in LA County. Invest in the state of California. You're lending your money to the government, they'll pay you back. At the same time, you get a tax break in the state of California on your tax return. Now, if you lend money to the city of Las Vegas and you live in, Col in California, your tax is going to be taxable because it's in another state and you live in California. Why do you think so many rich professional athletes live in Nevada and Florida and Texas? and the state of Washington and Alaska. Why? They don't live in Alaska, but in those states. Why? State in, no state income tax. And all the money you make in that state is tax-free. Now, you still have to pay money on your federal return, but you do not pay state and local taxes if you live in Texas, Florida, Nevada, Washington, and there's a few others. That's why a lot of people move there. But if you live in the state of California, your income is taxable. But if you get income from local or municipal bonds, you do not have to pay tax on that. This is where we get into our last week of discussion, tax planning. Once you reach a certain level of income and investments, it's time to start planning where you can avoid taxes. Steve Ballmer, you probably don't know him but he's the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers. And he was employee number three at Microsoft Corporation way back in the 1980s. Mr. Ballmer has a net value of investments of $100 billion. You know how much tax he paid in 2020? Zero. <laughs> he paid no taxes. Last year, Professor Hassey paid over $20,000 in taxes. If it was more than that, but I'm not going to give you the details. And I don't make, I don't have $100 billion of investments. Steve Ballmer paid no taxes last year. Really? How does he get around that? Well, it's the tax law. It's tax exemptions. It's tax, it's investing in investments that, don't, that are not taxed. So the more money you make, you can take advantage of these tax situations. And we'll talk about that in our last class. Explained these already. Descriptions of stocks and bonds. Some links you might wanna be interested in. Bond ratings. When you invest in a bond, the first thing you should, before you lend money to the government, to the state of California, to General Motors, you should ask, oh, what is your credit rating? If I'm gonna lend money to a friend of mine, the first thing I'm gonna say is, hey, dude, what's your FICO score? 800? Okay, I'll lend you the money. Hey, dude, what's your FICO score? 500? All right, I'll lend you the money, but you're gonna have to pay me an awful lot of interest. The credit rating is going to determine the risk of that investment. Triple A, great credit. Triple C, stay away from. Just like a FICO score. Triple A would be 850. Triple C would be 450. Stay away from it. If you lend them your money, you better expect high interest and the risk of default. And that can be a hassle. So understand credit ratings is very important in investing. Also, if I'm gonna buy a stock, it'd be a good idea to know what the credit rating of that stock is or that company. 
if they have a poor credit rating, am I expecting much return out of that stock down the road if they're not doing very well? Understand the credit ratings of companies is important. Okay, that video, that, um, that, um, don't pay attention to that. Uh, that uh, PowerPoint is located in our Blackboard discussion and you're welcome to it, but that gives us a good idea what chapter four in investing is all about. And I ask you questions about this in our assignment number three this coming week due on Saturday, July 17th. Two things, answer the questions and then update your portfolio as of Friday, July 16th. Okay, so that gives us a good idea of, about investments, about what uh, these things are. Look at that PowerPoint. There's some questions concerning that PowerPoint in the assignment. Uh, there'd be a good review of that to keep that available. Update your portfolio this week, and we're at the halfway point, our direct study, and you're all doing very well, and I appreciate your efforts. Again, you know where to find me if you have any questions or concerns. I'll do a, a mid-week, a mid-class video next weekend. And then I'll we'll see you again on uh, Saturday, July 24th for our next class, which will be about financial planning and insurance. One of the ways to avoid risk in the markets is have good insurance. And that we'll talk about that in our next class. You guys be safe, be well. Elizabeth and Stella, it's been a pleasure and I'll talk to you down the road. Take care.